The Illicit Happiness of Other People is my second novel and it is about a 17 year old cartoonist called Uni Chako uh, who <clears throat> at the end of a, an unremarkable day when he did a set of very ordinary things which includes getting, a, getting his hair cut comes home and jumps off the terrace and uh, <clears throat> nobody knows why he did what he did and his alcoholic father sets out to investigate what has happened and the only clues he has are the cartoons of the 17 year old cartoonist and uh, the investigation uh, takes the father who's Avsep Chako uh, through the lives of several other characters who used to know this the 17 year old boy uh, this is the uh, framework of the novel um, but through this I, I try to explore uh, what happens when I mean we all talk about clarity and sanity but what happens when you have too much clarity that's the question I want to raise and um, I also want to ask if there is such a thing called sanity and if sanity is merely a majority condition. So these are some of the questions and these are some of the areas that I try to explore in the novel and uh, I believe it's a happy novel. Yes, and in, in fact I, I, would, I would like not to explain the title too much because one surprising thing which has happened since the release of the book is the various interpretations of various people uh, of the title and uh, when obviously psychologically people would try try to value the author's interpretation of the title more I, I don't think you should but anyway there's a reason for it um, uh, I'm in a way investigating happiness and we all seem to have been sold on the idea that the pursuit of happiness is a fundamental goal of life but are we very sure? I mean, is, are we really in pursuit of happiness, or, or is it the happy, is it happiness which is in pursuit of us? In fact, I argue in the book that there is something inescapable about happiness, and I find there's something fascinating and eerie about it. It is as if nature has invented a drug to ensure that we will always sustain nature or an important component of nature. There is something devious about the invention of happiness and some characters in the book try to think a bit too deeply about the nature of happiness and why we are so addicted to happiness. It's an addiction uh, and it's something inescapable at the same time. What happens to people who understand this or who believe that they understand this is uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> major strands of the novel. So there is a, a, a hypothesis that there's something illicit about happiness. And when we try to investigate happiness, it, 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 it is extremely clear when we try to look at the lives of others you know, to understand the happiness because it's very difficult to understand our own happiness. So that I would say is one of the reasons why I wanted to call it that uh, though that's just my interpretation of the title and I'm, I'm absolutely fine with people having various other interpretations and also there's another uh, concept that uh, uh, there are several psychiatric concepts that I discuss through characters in the book one of them is uh, is the power of delusions most of what we think are beliefs and ideologies and sitting at Jaipur Literary Festival you meet a lot of ideologues and I, I can see that most of them are deluded um, we seem to have a very poor understanding of our own beliefs and ideologies uh, one character in my book argues um, that the fundamental nature of a delusion is to spread like a virus and try to colonize as many minds as possible so that the deluge can, 
can grow and can be passed on and can survive and it is not to me a far fetched thought because if you if you take any organized religion it is the triumph of a delusion and in our lives in our world there are successful delusions which are religion ideologies and some philosophies and there are failed delusions which are called delusions so the conflict between the successful delusions and the failed delusions is what we largely call human life and it is not a value judgment on anything i just find it very amusing and interesting and i think uh we need uh, if we are if we are in the pursuit of clarity i think we have to understand the true nature of delusion oh it's so it's a lot of characters i used to know um they always say that fiction is called fiction for legal reasons uh but i know that these are people who will never sue me so uh, it is a story probably 20 25 years in the making i needed to develop a set of skills uh to write the story uh, because i i knew that as a novel it's novel itself is complicated but this novel in the novel this this story in a novel form would be extremely complicated i knew that i i had to develop some skills so uh, once i was confident i mean after the first book i i i picked up a few things and i knew that i can now tell the story and also uh i was less shy about telling a somewhat somewhat autobiographical novel so uh, it's something i would have never done in my 20s or early 30s so unichako is the 17 year old you know the kind of 17 year old who will look at you very carefully who has opinions and who's fit who's physically very beautiful and is a kind of a boy there's a particular kind of a boy who will have long conversations with his mother uh who doesn't look like look at his mother as just a utility which makes food but with whom you can have intellectually stimulating conversations uh who slightly or maybe deeply in conflict with his father who is some days a good person and who some days uh just calm and silent and moody um who likes to bowl he doesn't like to bat which is very rare among among boys uh and he's a is a is an extremely talented cartoonist uh and like most cartoonists uh his cartoons are funny but he's not funny when you meet him um his father ausid chako is he belongs to a particular breed of malayali alcoholic journalists who have been wiped out now because the world has no place anymore for wild men if you want a full time job you today the world the, the way the world is you can't be the kind of men that existed uh, in the 80s you know among them the alpha men in fact the book there's a portion in the book which tries to answer what killed the alpha male um <clears throat> his wife mariamma chako is post graduate economics and she has a post graduate degree in economics and she's but she's a housewife and she has her set of problems her set of mysteries which the novel tries to resolve and then uh, there's a 12 year old character which when a lot of readers have reacted very strongly to this character the 12 year old younger brother of Unichako Toma Chako who um is not sure about his place in the world and he is pre- preoccupied like many boys of my generation used to in the late 80s 1990 no in the 80s will i make it will i make it through life and life was something which was very intimidating um i know a lot of men who once they were once upon a time when they were 12 year old they had these this question will i make it so toma chako is preoccupied with that question so these are the main characters and i would uh i can say that they all existed and some of them exist 
It's set in Madras uh, and it's set in 1990 chiefly. Uh, but because it is an investigation into the past of a person, there is a lot of 1980s Madras, I would say 1980s, 1990. That is the period in which the, this novel is set. And it's a very crucial period in the life of Madras because that was just the last days of a particular kind of city where you could, you could generalize, you could say something distinct about a city and you could be right. And after that, slowly, all the cities in our country began to resemble each other, except Bombay. Uh, so it was a particular time, just when we were beginning to slip into a position, or were nudged into a position by our very uh, dear friends, dear socialist friends, and we were just about to pawn our gold. Just before we pawned our gold is when the story happens. I'm, I'm, I'm incapable of nostalgia. Uh, I like people who are nostalgic. And uh, as a writer, I do, uh, I like it when people are nostalgic. And when I was much younger, I could enjoy that uh, uh, warm ball in your throat when someone is nostalgic. I remember as a very young boy, I saw a headline with Gavaskar's photograph saying, those were the days, you know, and I, I used to be completely enchanted by the expression, those were the days, it stands for so many things, something beautiful and sad about it. But somehow I don't know what has happened to me now, I'm not capable of nostalgia. Uh, but I, uh, that was good for the novel, because uh, while I did approach my past and Madras with a, with, with a bit of affection and uh, malice, uh, I was never blinded by love for uh, either Madras or uh, my past. And that's good because uh, I find that writers tend to lose their power of judgment when they talk about their own lives. They begin to think too many things are cute which are just not interesting, it's bloody boring. They start writing 10 pages about their grandmoms. <clears throat> which is interesting to them, which is just plain boring, because you, because it's, it all matters so much to you, you lose your power of judgment. And that is the biggest problem with memoir, which tries to be a novel. That is the biggest challenge writers should, uh, I, mean, do, I mean, that writers face, or they should, they should know they're facing that challenge, that what you think is interesting about your life may not be interesting at all. And there is such a thing called interesting, that's one thing which is never discussed in festivals or in literary criticism, you know. Just don't bloody bore people, you know. It's not shameful. Interesting is not a shameful word. You can be a serious writer. You can, be a, you can try to achieve important things. But if you are not interesting, uh, you are losing one layer of storytelling. And uh, that's what I try to do in journalism also. Let's not be ashamed of the word interesting. It does not mean being flippant uh, or frivolous. Uh, it's just adding one more layer. It's like a character. You know, how Madras is a character in my book and being interesting is a character in the works of all great writers. Well, I took about three years to write this book. I started immediately after I finished the first one, which took some time to get published. Um, so I took about three years. Uh, <clears throat> the first draft is the most difficult one. That's when uh, you're creating everything. Then... <clears throat> At least when I rework my copy, I know that a lot of things are not working and I have to tighten a few things, you know, those things happen. But then what is most fascinating, and I'm sure it will happen again and again, I hope I write another book, is all those things that you thought were great in your first draft, the great first paragraph, the great lines, those are the things which usually go when <clears throat> you're reworking the copy because times when you think great going, you're writing great literature, <clears throat> that's exactly the time when you're writing crap, probably. <clears throat> well, journalism does contribute in many ways. Uh, um, one thing is that it forces you to write a lot. And as a professional writer, a professional writer need not be a superior writer to an amateur writer. But, what a, prof but a professional writer has some skills, which is that you don't linger too much on your own mediocrity sometimes. There are times as an artist you will be mediocre. Just accept it and move on. 
don't keep talking about writing just write so these are things journalists know you know they and uh, <clears throat> in my experience i've seen that novelists who are journalists or who have been journalists they are the ones who never talk about writer's block usually people who are not journalists who are attempting novels i hear writer's block from them because as a journalist you're trained to write when you have to write you can't go to your editor and say excuse me i i'll file the copy next month because you know it's not working out but yes there is it is true that sometimes you are you can only write mediocre prose for days but as a journalist you know that it happens it's okay it's a professional like like you know that's why federer is a professional or all you know top tennis players the professionals they lose they feel bad they even cry but they will do it again you know they'll pick themselves up and you have to do it that is what a professional does so journalism trains you to be to have a professional mindset when you when you try to approach writing and not be too trapped in the artistic vanities of writing which is there but you have to see all these layers very clearly